You've seen the title, you want the answer. Can you throttle a solid rocket motor? No, you can't. Thanks for watching though, it's been great. Um, although I guess if you, if, well, okay, so if you, This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Since the fall of 2015, I've been trying to propulsively land a model rocket like SpaceX and Blue Origin. I'm not a math guy, but I thought it would take three months, and um, it's been a little bit more than three months. There are a thousand difficult parts to doing something like this, even at the model scale. And especially at the model scale, one of the difficult parts is the reliability of these little model rocket motors. Let's do a quick rocket engine recap. A rocket motor needs two things to burn, a fuel and an oxidizer. You set them on fire, restrict the flow a little bit, and boom, you've got thrust. And look at that, you're now as smart as any propulsion engineer. In a liquid rocket, Rocket, the propellant and the oxidizer are liquids stored in separate tanks. This means you can control the flow into the combustion chamber, which lets you control the thrust of the rocket. But in a solid rocket, the fuel and oxidizer are mixed together in a sort of rubbery sludge. That mix gets poured into the combustion chamber and you light it when you're ready to fly. The downside is that they're already mixed together, so you can't change the rate that they burn, which means you can't change the thrust. So in this sense, can you control the throttle of a solid rocket motor? No. But I have two caveats here. Caveat number one, there's another type of rocket motor called a hybrid motor, which uses a solid fuel and a liquid oxidizer. The oxidizer flows over the solid fuel, mixing and burning as it goes, and you can control the ox flow, which means you can control the throttle. We don't use hybrids though, because hybrids are trash. If you're gonna be a bear, be a grizzly. If you're gonna use liquids, go buy propellant. Caveat number two, you actually can control the rate at which solid motors burn in a few fancy ways. You could use a variable throat diameter for your rocket. You could use a well-sealed sliding chamber to expand or contract the size of the combustion chamber. You could vent a little bit of exhaust out the side of the chamber, and all of these things are effectively changing the pressure within the combustion chamber, and the pressure is going to directly affect the burn rate, which is going to directly affect the thrust the motor can produce. So yes, you can throttle solid motors in that way, but at the hobby scale, I don't have the manufacturing capability or the propulsion expertise to build something like that. So what are we going to do here? Well, we can't change what happens inside the combustion chamber, but we can change what happens after the exhaust leaves the exit plane of the nozzle. The first way I tried throttling one of these motors is something called the Krushnik effect. The basic idea is that as a rocket motor becomes more and more recessed inside of a tube, it loses its effective thrust. The effect isn't very well understood, and the way that the exhaust gas interacts with the wall is inherently chaotic and turbulent, so it's very hard to simulate and also correlate different geometries with the thrust reduction that you'd see from this effect. In the fall of 2021, I conducted a series of test fires with fixed length sleeves extended to various lengths away from the nozzle exit. All right, firing, three, two, one. The goal here was to see how much throttle control we could really achieve using this effect. I fired quite a few motors during this campaign and stuck with 3D printed sleeves. Toward the end of the burn, the sleeve would begin melting, but for these motors, it only needs to hold for about three and a half seconds. Regardless, I also cut out a disc of eighth inch aluminum to try as a more robust and closed down throat just to push things to the extreme. Firing in three, two, one. With all the tests complete, we can take a look at the data. All of these tests were fired on a test stand that I built a few years ago. There's a video about how I built it in the description down below, but we use a load cell to measure the thrust from the rocket motor. We record that data, and now we can take a look at what the tests show. Without digging too deep, we can already see a slight correlation between the amount that the sleeve is extended and the reduction in thrust. In this very specific case, correlation is probably causation, but the effect is not widely repeatable. 
For instance, there are sections where inconsistencies of the motor almost negate the effect of the throttle. And this brings up an interesting point, which is how much control do we really need to land one of these things? I won't bore you with the simulation, so I'll tell you that I found I needed about 20% throttle range in order to land one of these rockets reliably each time. That means that we nominally operate at like a 90% throttle, where we can go up 10% or down 10%. I arrived at these numbers using all of the past data that I've collected on these Estes F-15 rocket motors. So with these numbers and the Krushnik effect, it's just not gonna cut it. We can maybe get like 10 or 15% throttle, but there's still that edge case 5% that's probably not gonna be reliable enough. So the next idea is a little whack, but hear me out. What if we blocked all of the thrust as like a binary thing? It's either the thrust is on or it's off. And then we just modulate the amount of time that that thrust is blocked in cycles. This is called pulse width modulation. It's used to control servos. It's actually used to control all sorts of things. And I don't know, thought it might work. I could show you the sims I ran to confirm that this approach would work, but why don't I show you something that actually uses it in real life? Also, shout out to me uh, editing this right now because I forgot to film it uh, when I was filming. This is a test of a KKV, or Kinetic Kill Vehicle. This is a device designed to take down the warhead from an ICBM while it's in space, which is crazy and very high stakes, but it's using pulsed on and off thrust from these vertical and horizontal thrusters to maintain attitude control, and more importantly, maintain its altitude, its position in space. It's easy to see why spacecraft use this sometimes, because valves that control the flow rate of a liquid or a gas are a little bit heavier and more complicated than valves that just turn it on or off. So if you can make those binary valves, those on-off valves work, that's a little bit better for your design in terms of simplicity. I CNC'd the thrust blocker out of aluminum and set it up to actuate on a servo. I was careful to align the blocking surface so that when the blocker was under thrust loads, the exhaust spread out evenly and not biased to one side. And this is important for maintaining attitude control. And you know what else is important? Um, the melting point of aluminum, that's important. Three, two, one. Turns out black powder burns at about 1600 degrees Celsius or 3000 degrees Fahrenheit and aluminum melts well before that, like under half of that temperature. So the Krusnik effect isn't gonna work. The aluminum blocker also had some weird side force stuff and clearly aluminum isn't gonna cut it. So we're starting to get outside of my manufacturing capability. What do we do? As a last ditch effort, I Googled solid rocket motor throttle control, and I found this purple link, which means I've clicked on it before. Someone had posted about a year ago on the rocketry subreddit with this interesting blocker mechanism. And I reached out to the person to find out more and learned that the blockers used here are cast ceramic, which is like brilliant. Huge thanks to Josh from Simple Robotics, by the way, for sharing his work and being willing to chat about his design, links in the description. So I got to work on my own version, which uses easy to machine ultra high temperature ceramic from McMaster, rated to about 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. I tossed two servos on the side of the mechanism, cobbled together some code to deflect the paddles various amounts and set it up on the test stand. Firing in three, two, one. After firing, I did notice a little cracking in the ceramic, but the results in the test data look incredible. Different amounts of deflection correlate cleanly with different throttle percentages. Now, like I said earlier, repeatability is key. These results need to be consistent across multiple firings. So I milled out a slightly updated shape for the ceramic paddles and found out that I'm just bad at drilling. <laughs> Okay, so this is like very interesting to me. We've got these throttle sections here, 
on the bench and you can tell that they're like a little worse for the wear, right? They've been split up here and they've been forced apart at roughly the same point. We saw cracking in those first paddles that we fired. Now it didn't cause problems during the firing, but it's not something I'd really want to fly with. That cracking seemed to be in about the same place as this cracking. And I drilled them with slightly different techniques. I used a hand drill for the first ones, but I do think this is about chip evacuation or just debris evacuation. So like you're pressing the drill press down and it's going into the part, right? And as you're pressing the drill press down, you have less and less evacuation area. We haven't been peck drilling for these. We've just been going straight in all the way through. And I think that was my mistake. So this is a manufacturing error. And luckily I have extra stock material, although I just burned through, uh, was probably about like $185 of it because I don't know how to drill. So let's not do that again. An important thing to note here is that whenever I'm working with ceramic, I'm always using a respirator. You can also see there's a lot of dust in the room. If I shine the light backwards, see all that dust? That is why, that is why you wear a respirator. Ceramic dust getting in your lungs is not a thing you want if you want to live for a long time. And just if you want to be like a healthy person, you've got to protect your lungs. That dust is not good for you. So if you're doing anything similar, please, please, please get a proper respirator and make sure you wear it when you're working with this material. All right, back to the test fire footage. Looking at this data is incredible. I'm blown away by how consistent the results are. And we're not even done with this whole thing because there's a bonus cherry on top. I've been working with these Estes F-15 rocket motors. Now, black powder burns at about 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, APCP, ammonium perchlorate, burns much hotter, but that allows us to work with those super long burn motors from Aerotech. So I redesigned the mechanism a little bit to work with metal parts so things wouldn't melt quite as quickly, and I test fired that. It's a staircase. It's a it's a it's a staircase. Like it's it looks amazing. I'm so stoked with these results. Having throttle control on an 18 second burn at the hobby scale is nuts. And I'm like <laughs> You can tell I'm very excited about it. All right, two final things before we wrap this up. First, see those fangs on the side of the ceramic paddles? I mentioned APCP burns much hotter than black powder, and initially I thought this was the ceramic melting or foaming or like breaking down. I actually don't think that's the case. I think this is from the metal content of the ammonium perchlorate motor. Um, when you burn an APCP motor, APCP is just the oxidizer. The fuel is uh, usually like powdered aluminum. Um, and so I think these are metal deposits that are sort of existing as like stalagmites. They're like upside down stalagmites, not stalactites. That's what I think is going on here because they're aligned pretty well with the nozzle. Um, they do still let us throttle. We still have control. Um, it's a little bit less good than it was before, but we are still able to cut, you know, I like half-ish of the thrust. And thing number two is a quick mention about side forces. On the F-15 motors, side forces were virtually zero. I had a load cell attached to the side of the mechanism and on each firing plotted the amount of force that we were getting that was like off-axis or non-axial, almost zero. 
uh, absolutely within our ability to control that during flight. For the G8, for that APCP motor, those side forces are going to be a little bit bigger. The load cell didn't catch any of the side forces, but you can see the motor wiggling back and forth on the axis that we're not recording. So this is more confirmation that we should probably fire this motor one or two more times before we put it on a hopper or any type of flight vehicle. If you want to check out the data from these motors, I've put all of the data on Patreon. Uh, the link is in the description below. And at a different level, if you want to use this design, I've put the designs like the CAD step files. Um, those are up on Patreon as well. Again, link in the description down below. Um, I'm stoked to fly these things myself and I want other people to be able to try it. So that stuff is there. Now, if you follow this channel, you're probably interested in teaching yourself stuff and learning new things, which is why it's great that today's sponsor for the video is Skillshare. If you're not already aware, Skillshare is a learning platform with thousands of online courses across 150 countries. The goal of Skillshare is to inspire discovery through creativity. We're still early on in 2022. I know that I've set some goals for myself to learn some new things. And if that's something that you've done as well, maybe you're thinking of starting a Model Rocket YouTube channel. So you could check out a few filmmaking courses from these fine folks. Personally, I also use After Effects a lot. I do a lot of my rocket tracking and stabilization in After Effects. So you could try this course on three-dimensional camera tracking from Jake Bartlett and get started there. Skillshare is ad-free and launches new premium courses every single week. So there is no shortage of content for you to learn from. And their entire catalog is now available with subtitles in Spanish, French, Portuguese, and German. So the first 1,000 people to sign up using this link right here will get a full month, one full month free for Skillshare. This link is also in the description down below. You can check it out there. One more time, using this will get you a full free month of Skillshare. Thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video and thank you to you for watching. We're gonna get one of these throttled rocket motors up in the air soon and I am over the moon, kind of pun intended. Uh, I'm so excited to get one of these things in the air. So thanks again for watching. My name's Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.